Yes, so um, our next guest, as, as the unfortunate reality is that we are all overseas territories, whether they are British overseas, French overseas, or Dutch overseas territories, and we also have one American overseas territory. And territory, as we know, is basically a nice name for colony. So one of the mandates of this show is to educate our people on the processes of self-governance or some other words decolonization so because i'm not a expert in the subject matter we have experts in the field from our region we don't need to bring anybody in from europe to tell us about decolonization because they taught us pretty well about colonization mm -hmm. so without further ado i introduce you now to mr blackman who's actually a cousin to <laughs> someone who's married to my cousin. It's a small world. Yes. Yes, good evening, thank everybody. You, and, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the expert part, but I have uh, been through, let's call it the school of hard knocks mm -hmm. when it comes to legalization since returning from Europe to my uh, island of birth, well, well known to you, Seba. So let me just go quickly to uh, or start where we are now um, in terms of the Dutch uh, territories. Um, the first um, important uh, thing to know is that the, the decolonization, the complete decolonization in accordance with uh, the UN Charter and the different relevant uh, resolutions was never completed for the Dutch Caribbean islands. So you had the Netherlands Antilles. Uh, initially, you had the Netherlands Antilles and Suriname. Uh, they were not completely decolonized until Suriname left the Kingdom of the Netherlands in 1975 and became completely independent. So then you had the Netherlands and Tilly's remaining with uh, six islands. And those six islands really had, uh, when I say, uh, I wouldn't say little in common, because obviously there were a lot of uh, family and other relationships uh, between the islands. But in terms of, um, let's say, um, you know, they were basically like independent little states. You know, uh, by definition, an island is, you know, surrounded by water and it creates a certain island feel, uh, a certain independent feeling. So um, the, the complicating factor there was that the biggest, by far largest island, Curacao, was kind of seen as, uh, you know, the, the mini colonizer among the islands, right? So the, the federal government was, um, had its seat in, in Curacao. Uh, the funding from the Netherlands went first to the central government in Curaçao, and then it would trickle down to the islands to a certain extent. Uh, so that uh, constellation really was not really was not working. Um, so, but to go back to when the decolonization should have uh, started and should have been finalized. So, in 1945, the UN basically mandated that uh, you know colonialism in all its forms should be abolished and all countries should become independent. That was the initial uh, point of departure. And then later on, as time went on, uh, you know, countries realized that pure strict independence was not necessarily uh, or should not always be the end point for, uh, for a nation, for people. They could choose for other forms, uh, free association and sometimes even integration. Um, but what happened actually in 1954 is that uh, the Netherlands uh, so the European part of the country uh, kind of sold to the world at the UN acceptance of the new kingdom that the decolonization was finalized, right? So they kind of, uh, and of course, the, the let's say the political elite on those islands had an interest play country and, and play independent. They kind of colluded for lack of a better word, to sell to the world that with this new kingdom order, uh, the decolonized. Uh, so the UN passed a resolution, uh, resolution 940. The uh, you know, excused 
of uh, Article 73 of the United Nations uh, Section E. Article 73 has A through uh, the Aiden, are you hearing him? I think I just stopped out. It's, uh, yep, if the screen froze. Zemi, are you there? Okay, he's probably refreshing. Hey. Are you off and on? Okay, go ahead, you're back. There you go. Can you? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let me try to continue. Back on. 1954 is that uh, Holland uh, did not have the Netherlands about its sub E of the, the, the however, the other obligations and cities to uh, develop with due the specificities of the, the territories help them uh, to build up the all of those obligations were to prepare the territories for ultimate independence resolution uh, is. However, the interpretation of that, at least by the Netherlands, is that well, since port that they went this further, and that brings us to um, as at least. In Martin, we have said decolonization was not it's of the U. When can't in the decade for the of well, in what would be um, the top priority because. Talking about development, talking about uh, environmental challenges, no matter how you uh, look at those issues that the I it, it all boils down to them not being able to make the best decisions for their societies and their people without uh, undue external interference from the metropolitan state. So that's where you have that 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 tension. I would say that has existed for the last. 70 years and recently it has uh, basically come to uh, the phase where at least uh, within the Dutch Caribbean islands the discussion is there with the Netherlands uh, the Netherlands uh, you know we have piles of academic research proving that the decolonization was not finalized so what we are doing now is um, making bringing that awareness not just to our people but also to the Netherlands and um, trying to convince them that they should finalize that process and which also would be in their benefit. Because the problem is that from a constitutional standpoint, the islands of the former Netherlands and Tilly, so the Dutch Caribbean islands, are kind of in a constitutional purgatory. They are fish nor fowl. They are not completely independent, uh, yet they are not integrated. So what you see happening is that when an international issue arises, for instance, with the Venezuelan uh, refugees in Curaçao, the Netherlands says, you know, your autonomous country, um, you have to take care of that issue, not just capacity-wise, but also uh, funding-wise. Um, and when it's convenient to the Netherlands, they can impose uh, financial regulations. So, you know, we are saying <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too, obviously. So it's in Holland's interest, the Netherlands' interest, to finalize the decommunication because then they won't be able to be blamed because they are saying, yeah, you know, when it goes wrong, we are blamed, and but you guys still want our money and resources. Right? So, so you have on both sides of the coin, you have that, that argument. And we are saying, look, if you finalize the decomposition, the authority, the responsibilities are clearly 
delineated. So nobody can point fingers. Um, you know, we'll just have to um, make do with what we have um, and, and paddle our own canoe um, based on the obligations that Holland still has. And that brings, um, brings us to the topic of uh, reparations because Holland has, um, because of Article 73 of the UN Charter, has, uh, let's say, a retroactive obligation uh, towards uh, the islands uh, of the Dutch Caribbean, at least in our, in our opinion. So that is in a nutshell what has been uh, going on in the Dutch Caribbean islands. And uh, in terms of Caribbean, uh, the, the larger Caribbean context, the question is, if uh, the decolonization of the Dutch Caribbean islands was not completed, that would have to lead to the conclusion that it was not completed for the British territories either. Um, and that then leads to the question, um, should the Dutch, uh, the British, but also the French territories who fall under the same UN Charter uh, and whose metropolitan states have the same obligations, uh, should they join forces and um, you know, uh, approach their metropolitan states uh, jointly uh, and make sure that the de decolonization is, is, is finalized. So that is, that is in terms of the, the wider Caribbean context, um, what, is, what is currently being um, looked at. Uh, from St. Martin, we have reached out to other territories. We have shared the, the information about the whole decolonization process in the Dutch territories and why we feel that it should be applicable to, uh, to all the territories. So that is in a nutshell, going from 1945-54 to where we are today. Um, so the dialogue with the Netherlands is uh, ongoing and we are looking to ramp up that dialogue with our sister islands, at least in the Dutch Caribbean, to um, bring the decolonization to a successful, um, successful end. Right. Yes, I am muted. <laughs> All right. So Chris, I'm gonna ask him a few questions and then you can share with us your experience because we know that you just came back from the C24 committee, um, the decolonization committee meeting that was held last week. Um, I don't know if you were there as well, Xavier, in terms of representing on your end, no? Un okay. Unfortunately, I was not, no. I was in Bonaire attending another uh, important meeting of the, the parliaments within the Dutch kingdom. So that was, I would say uh, at least equally important. Okay, so we, we're we gonna start first with a comment that just popped up because your connection was in and out there for a second. So the person was saying it was unfortunate that you are freezing up <laughs> when you were explaining the history part of the sham decolonization process. Um, I guess kind of like you, you summarized it at the end, hopefully in terms of person realizing, because I actually, I think I, I misstated in the last show when we started talking about decolonization that you guys had gone through the, the process of integration only to find out when you and I spoke that uh, not so fast, <laughs> you know, in terms of it being completed and the importance of that. Because one of the questions I would pose to you is why is it taking so long? Because again, is if this is an international mandate. We're having meetings every year to say, this is what we want then why, why, whether it's on the administrative power or it's on the, um, the local government's end, where, where is this thing bottlenecking? Okay. Well, it, it, the problem started with the fact that, uh, like I said earlier, that uh, interpretation uh, by the Dutch kingdom that uh, with um, um, the acceptance of the new kingdom charter, Article 73E was not applicable they interpreted that as Article 73 in its totality was not applicable anymore. Mm -hmm. So there you get a, a misinterpretation and that has then been, um, let's say since 1954, that has kind of been the narrative. So the Netherlands have been able to, let's say, hide the fact that they did not uh, decolonize. And the kingdom structure of the Netherlands is so uh, unique, I would say, not even that complicated, but unique that most nations don't even understand it. So they don't realize that um, the structure that we have now is one of an incomplete decolonization. On the end of the islands, like I said before, the political elite had an interest in, you know, 
uh, for lack of a better word again, playing country and saying, look, we are autonomous, we have our own prime minister, right? Mm -hmm. So which from their perspective also is, is understandable. But so jointly and you know, inadvertently, both parties on both sides of the coin, they have contributed to this notion, this narrative that, well, they, you know, they, yeah, they, they were, it was done. Yeah. Right. And everybody's happy, is happy with it. So that has kind of been, so uh, nothing happened. And of course, the Dutch had no interest in, you know, raising this issue. The, the Caribbean islands didn't have that much of an interest either because it was a kind of a comfortable and safe cushion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the Dutch had this concept of, of benevolent colonialism. Right. So, you you know, why should you? Uh, you had the same thing with slavery, you know, but you, you're getting fed, you know, uh, three times yeah, a day. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not so it's not so bad. bad. It's not so bad. Right. Well, how are you going to fend for yourself? Right. So mm -hmm. that uh, was indeed um, uh, that has been that narrative have, has been spread over the years. And nobody really looked into the legal specificities, specificity of that uh, of that 1954 uh, resolution by the UN. So now that that all has become uh, clear and uh, academic research has shown what the actual legal status is of these islands, now we can have that uh, that discussion. Okay. So what's the goal? Is the goal integration? And what would that look like? Um, not necessarily integration. The goal is, so the UN basically says um, whatever the outcome is of the, just one second, hold on. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the whatever the outcome of the decolonization is, according to based on the UN Charter, it should also always lead to a full measure of self-government on the basis of absolute equality with the metropolitan state. Right. So, theoretically speaking, you could say that even if you integrate with the metropolitan state, you would be independent within that metropolitan state because you have a full measure self-government and then you have all kind of criteria that um, that you can uh, use to check off if you have a full measure of self-government without external interference so you have basically they started with three models of uh, of a full measure of self-government one is independence full-fledged independence and sovereignty um, free association and uh, full integration and then they realize that you know they're all kind of hybrid forms that are possible once both partners are completely I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. in, right, happy with it. And, you know, the will of the people have to be expressed, whether it's a referendum or the people that you vote in the office make that choice. So it's it's not a black and white uh, okay. picture. But yeah. what uh, at least St. Martin is looking for is a full measure of self-government. And that does not mean technically, uh, let's say, formal independence in terms of um, a St. Martin passport, uh, a country outside of the Dutch Kingdom, because based on the UN requirements, uh, St. Martin already has independence within the Kingdom on paper. It's just that the Dutch has never treated us that way. We have never demanded that they treat us that way. Okay. okay. Awesome. So, Chris, how was the trip? Oh, Are you I having a question, Eden? Yes, oh. yes, please. Um, very, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing that. I am curious as to your perspective and when we talk about things like food sovereignty having a greater stake in our ability to um, control our resource flow here within the region and uh, the ability of countries to say i prefer to get my my cassava from from jamaica instead of from south america or if i i, I want to get my goods within the region or when the ideas that i had talked about about uh, us uh, having more control of shipping and crews within our region for instance how much? What what kind of legs do we have to stand on to make those decisions uh, as a region about how our resources are managed and uh, who gets the lion's share of those of those spoils? Because we all know where the balance lies right now. There's a whole a whole lot of of uh, outside interests that are outside of the region. Um, so uh, where does this leave us in terms of talking about managing our own resources and? unifying in any kind of meaning, meaningful way to change that paradigm to something that more benefits the Caribbean? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. And let me uh, shout out to uh, Mr. Simmons, who posed that, uh, who made that remark earlier. 
uh, that's a little segue to that because uh, Mr. Simmons was a commissioner, government commissioner in St. Eustatius. And while I was there um, uh, working as an advisor, we actually organized a, um, a business uh, orientation visit to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and in that, and I, I listened to the previous uh, broadcast, uh, Shana, when you mentioned uh, indeed about the, the integration. So I picked that up. I said, I'll speak to you about that, about that later. But what I found very interesting, and I told uh, Chris that too, is that you all mentioned that food sovereignty and, and um, you know, especially in, in times of calamities. So in 2017, a delegation of, uh, of St. Eustatius went to uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and we met with one of the, the larger chambers of commerce there. And they had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs that were interested in shipping to St. Eustatius. And the benefit for St. Eustatius was that they could then set up small local industries. So we would, for instance, ship uh, rice or other uh, food products in bulk from Trinidad and Tobago to, to Stasia, re uh, process it, repackage it, and then ship it out uh, throughout the region. And, and obviously vice versa, we would then send. You're on mute, Xavier. Oh, sorry, yes. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, vice versa, we were looking at uh, Stasia exporting goat meat to Trinidad, you know, where they make the curry goat, obviously. So there are a lot of, uh, I, I hear that in your presentation as well, Eden, and I think that, that struck a chord one time. I think it should be done. That I think it's without question that we should uh, limit our dependence on, um, you, know, the, the, you know, players outside of the region. Uh, for instance, in St. Martin, one of the reasons why we looked at uh, those options, and St. Martin is also looking into that option, of Trinidad, uh, but also Suriname, is that once uh, a calamity hits in terms of, of hurricanes, uh, for St. Martin and the, the Northeastern Caribbean, the entire supply line is basically cut off. So you have Puerto Rico and then you have Miami. So you are completely cut off for, uh, for a while uh, from uh, food supplies while you have in the outside of the hurricane zone, you have, you know, Trinidad basically manufactures everything under the sun. I mean, they can really um, depend on their own uh, manufacturing. Uh, industry. So that was one of the reasons. And to tie into your question, um, Eden, one of the impediments for those kind of developments for the Dutch Caribbean islands is that foreign affairs is a kingdom affair. So technically, you would need permission from the metropolitan state to initiate these kind of um, these kind of uh, you know trade missions or, or relationships. Period. Uh, but it goes further. It goes to you know maritime agreements. Um, airline agreements uh, you know so it, it really limits us in uh, making choices that benefit our people because you have to get permission quote unquote from the metropolitan okay. state but definitely those initiatives uh, personally I think they should be um, definitely on the on the you know high on the agenda of all the Caribbean states and so right now it would be basically up to the communities or the private entities or businesses to say, you know what, I'm going to trade within the Caribbean. I'm going to set myself up and scale myself to be a Caribbean based business. It would, it would basically be up to the individual organization or it would be, it would be very difficult to approach it on a national level is what I'm saying. It'd be more yes. of a working of exactly. like how we're networking now. And you say, I'm going to trade with you. You're going to trade with me. We're going to trade with Shana. Shana is going to trade with Chris. And we're that we would only be able to close the loot that way as, but not in a meaningful way on a on a national official scale Correct. without, like you said, permission. Okay, right. Yeah, thank you for the for much. the Dutch Caribbean islands. At least that is that is an an impediment. Wow. Okay. Thank you. You on mute, Chris? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Thank you. It's been very informative because what, what tends to happen is us who are in the quote unquote English colonies, we don't know much about what's going on in the Dutch islands and I assume vice versa to some extent. I mean, a lot of people go to St. Martin. Most most people in the Eastern Caribbean have gone to St. Martin mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's a transit point and also, you know, there's a good bit of shopping, duty-free shopping or used to be duty-free shopping there, but the intricacies of what is going on there, we don't know. So thank, thank you for that. Um, what I would use as an analogy is that Shannon and I are biologically related. 
And Mr. Blackman, your biological cousin is related to my, is married to my biological cousin. So we're all related. However, um, in the last two months, up until about two months ago, we weren't, we didn't know each other. We weren't communicating with each other. So, you know, all of this, what's happening now is because we have formed a relationship and are working together. The challenge for us is that the European nations have basically been on the same WhatsApp chat group for the last 500 years. So whether the Dutch, French, Spanish, English, or to some extent the Danish who got kicked out, the point is they have collaborated amongst themselves as to how to keep us colonized. And when they couldn't colonize us, they found new terms and said, okay, you're since a part of the Dutch kingdom or you are overseas territory and you have British citizenship now. And people fall for that to be feel like, oh, they're treating us like equals now. No, they're, no, they're not, they're not. But I won't, I won't get too far into that. And as you said, they have locked up all even apart from the political dependency, they've, they've locked us into economic dependency that the big importers are buying from those that are have ties to European nations, right? We we live, you know, if the if planes actually flew on time, we most islands are half an hour away from each other. You could fly from Dominica to Saint Lucia in half an hour. You could fly from Barbados to Saint Lucia in half an hour. I could fly from Stacia to Saint Martin in twenty minutes, right? Cayman Islands is probably the most followed island, and um, based off of um, just ge geographic location. But my point is, how is it we have goods all the way from Europe, who's thousands of miles away from us, but we don't have goods from Guyana, which is, for lack of a better term, just down the road from us. 400 years of being on the same WhatsApp chat group, they worked that out already. Mm -hmm. um, Shana, to your question, um, I was in Dominica for the United Nations C24 conference. Um, it took me two days to get there because lack of flights. Yeah. It's half an hour. I was in St. Lucia, stuck in St. Lucia for two days because there's no flight to Dominica with journey half a, half an hour away. Wow. Uh, coming out of Dominica, stuck again. My 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 point is that we had United Nations there in the Caribbean hosting a conference about decolonization. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to guess how many Caribbean nations actually showed up? Not nations, but Caribbean islands showed up? Five. Nope. Less? Nope. Yeah, well, yes, yes, less. So wow. Three? The Dutch, we had the Dutch islands, right, which is what, one, two, three, four, Mr. Blackman? F well, technically, um, you could say Five. six. All right, six. So you have six Dutch islands. You have six... Um, English islands, and you have some degree, three French islands, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and St. Martin, the, the northern side. So there's nine, there are nine um, colonies, European colonies, 10 actually, if you add in USVI. There are mm -hmm. 10 European colonies still in the Caribbean. Um, 11 if you add in French Guyana. Mm -hmm. Only two showed up. Wow. The Virgin Islands and Bermuda. So when you have a, 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 a when you have a convention or a meeting about decolonization, and ten people don't show up, that indicates to the colonizers, well, maybe they aren't interested. Mm -hmm. So I, I won't prolong this subject because we could get into this another time. But the interest has to come from us. Number yeah, one, definitely. to connect with each other. Number two, to tell our own stories to the world. We, we cannot keep having the French, the Dutch, and the English telling our stories because they're painting a story as if all is well in paradise. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I will say thank, thank you, Mr. Blackman. And um, that, that will be my, my take on it for now. I, I know this is going to be an ongoing dialogue, so yeah. don't want to take that point. All in one night. Yeah. Excellent point. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm.